As we see in many Fischer games, his play is strategically crystal clear. Hello chess fans, this is Rick from Chess to Impress. Only two weeks left. On Tuesday, March 17th, 2020, the first round will be played of the Candidates Tournament, which will decide who will challenge world champion Magnus Carlsen for the world title in November 2020. On Chess to Impress, we have been counting down. I've done a few videos to get ourselves in the mood of the Candidates Tournament. As in the previous videos, I will start here with a historical overview of the Candidates Tournaments. If you have seen it already, you can skip to the game that I will show in this video. The timestamp of when the game starts is here. It's a game from the great Bobby Fischer, well worth watching. The tournament in London 1883 was not really an official Candidates Tournament, but Steinitz won the tournament and Zuckertort came second and it was decided that these two players would play the first official match for the World Championship. Willem Steinitz finished second behind world champion Emmanuel Lasker in the St. Petersburg tournament from 1895-1896 and it was decided that based on that result Steinitz gained the right to challenge Lasker for the world title. The tournament in the Netherlands in 1938 was won by Paul Keres and he gained the right to challenge world champion Al Yechin for the world title. But that match never happened because of World War II interfering. The first official candidates tournament was held in Budapest in 1950 and the tiebreak was held in Moscow in the same year. David Bronstein was the first official challenger of world champion Mikhail Botvinnik. Then it was the era of Vasily Smyslov. He won two candidates tournaments. The famous one in Zurich 1953 and also Amsterdam 1956. Yugoslavia 1959 was won by Misha Tal and it was his turn to challenge Botvinnik for the world title. Curaçao 1962 was won by Tigran Petrosyan. He challenged Botvinnik for the title and he won. Boris Paski won Tbilisi 1965, challenged Petrosyan for the world title and lost. But he qualified again in Kiev 1968 and then was able to defeat Petrosyan. In Buenos Aires 1971, Bobby Fischer beat Tigran Petrosyan to qualify for a match against Spassky. I put it in red because we're going to look at one of the games from that match. Moscow 1974 was won by Karpov. He beat Korchnoi in the final match and qualified to beat Fischer. Fischer did not defend his title, so Karpov became world champion. Viktor Korchnoi won two candidate match cycles. The final match in Belgrade and the final match in Merano was won by him and he challenged Karpov and lost both World Championship matches. Then the Kasparov era started. He won Vilnius 1984 and challenged Karpov for the world title, which he won after a total of three matches. And Karpov came back. He defeated Andrei Sokolov in Linares in 1987 to qualify for the fourth match against Kasparov. And he also beat Jan Timan in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur in 1990 to qualify for the fifth match against Kasparov. Nigel Short beat Karpov in the semi-finals and Timan in the final in San Lorenzo de El Escorial in 1993. And it was his turn to play Kasparov. Then the chess world was divided. I'm only giving here the results of the candidate cycle for the classical world championship. Anand won Las Palmas 1995, challenged Kasparov, and Kasorla 1998 was a strange one. Alexei Shirov beat Vladimir Kramnik and qualified to play Kasparov, but that match never happened. Kramnik did get a match in the year 2000 and beat Kasparov to become the 14th official classical world champion. Dortmund 2002 was won by Peter Leko from Hungary. And he played Kramnik in 2004 and almost beat him. The World Championship in 2007 was a eight-player round-robin tournament. But four players had to qualify and Lavon Aronian, Boris Gelfand, Alexander Grishuk and Peter Leko did qualify. Anand won that tournament to become the 15th official world champion. In Sofia in Bulgaria in 2009, Veselin Topalov beat Gata Kamsky to qualify to play Anand. And in 2011, it was Boris Gelfand's turn. He won the candidate matches in Kazan in Russia. 
In 2013, the Carlsen era started, he won the candidates tournament and qualified to play Anand. He beat Anand and beat him again in 2014 after Anand had won the candidates tournament in Ganti Mansisk to gain the right for a rematch against Carlsen. Moscow 2016 was won by Sergei Karyakin and he almost beat Carlsen in New York. And in 2018 Fabiano Carana from the USA won the candidates tournament and he also came very close to becoming world champion. Who will it be in Yekaterinburg 2020? As said, the tournament will start on March 17th. It's getting very very close. And these are the 8 players that will do battle in Yekaterinburg. If we start at the top left and we go clockwise we see Wang Hao, winner of the Grand Swiss. Next to him Anish Giri who qualified by rating. Fabiano Carana qualified by being the runner-up in the last World Championship match. Jan de Pomnichi qualified through the Grand Prix. At the bottom right you see Ding Li Ren from China and Timur Rajabo from Azerbaijan. They qualified because they were the finalists of the World Cup. Alexander Grishuk won the Grand Prix and qualified that way. And bottom left is Kirill Alexeyenko, the wild card, picked by the Russian organizers. Many people in the chess world think the wild card should have gone to Maxim Vashelagrav, who narrowly missed out on three of the categories. But Alexeyenko was eligible, was chosen, and will play. Back to 1971, the gentleman on the left, one of the greatest, if not the greatest player of all time, Bobby Fischer. On the right, Tigran Petrosyan, former world champion. He lost his title two years before this picture was taken to Boris Pasky. Fischer and Petrosyan played the candidates final in Buenos Aires 1971. And I'm going to show you game seven of that match. A battle on the chessboard between the USA and the Soviet Union. Fischer is white, Petrosyan is black. It is the 19th of October 1971. And... Fischer was leading by one point, three and a half against two and a half before this game was played. Fischer opened with the e-pawn, as he always did. We see the Sicilian, knight of three, e6, an open Sicilian, takes, takes, and a6. To some this is called the Paulson variation after the 19th century master Louis Paulson. To others it is the Khan variation named after the Soviet theoretician Ilya Khan. Black is guarding all the squares where the knight from d4 would like to jump to. Bishop d3 developing, and here knight f6 is the main move, but Petros Jan plays the other knight. Fischer trades on c6, and Petros Jan takes with the b pawn, taking towards the center. The d pawn wants to go to d5, a common theme in the Sicilian. Fischer castled, and there is that move d5, getting a foothold in the center. And Fischer plays c4, also fighting for the center. As we see in many Fischer games, his play is strategically crystal clear. And this game is a very good example, as we'll see. Knight f6, and Fischer took twice in the center. And all three captures are possible here, with the queen, with the knight, or with the pawn. Petrosian takes with the pawn and accepts the isolated queen's pawn position. This pawn is isolated, has no help from pawns on the E or C file. Fischer develops the knight. Petrosian develops the bishop and queen A4 check. Petrosian interposed with the queen. Bishop D7 is the alternative. In general, black does not want to swap too many pieces. The more pieces come off the board, the more the weakness of the isolated pawn is felt. So queen d7 was criticized by some analysts. But who are we to criticize a former world champion? White can win material here, but Fischer does not engage in cheap theatrics, as Fide Master Eric Schiller writes in this book. I took many of his comments for this video. The book is called Learn from Bobby Fischer's Greatest Games. Yes, white can win material with bishop b5. And that is threatening to win the queen. The queen is pinned, so you have to take. And then the rook is hanging in a corner. But black castles and will follow it up with bishop b7 and d4 and will have great compensation for the exchange. 
So Fischer does not go for these cheap threat tricks or cheap tricks. He plays rookie one. He does not want to win the exchange. The queens were swapped and bishop e6. Bishop e3 developing, Petrosian castled, and now bishop c5, which Schiller calls a key move. When the dark squared bishops get exchanged, white can attack the isolated pawn from the side with his rooks, and we'll see that happening in this game. That's why Fischer wants to swap the dark squared bishops. Rook fe8, the bishops are swapped, and b4, and black in fact has two weak pawns in his camp, not just the isolated pawn on d5, but also the pawn on a6 is a weak pawn. And the b2, b4 move sets up a knight move to c5, which will put pressure on the pawn on a6, with both bishop and knight. King f8 from Petrosian, there goes the knight, and bishop c8, protecting the pawn. It's now protected twice with rook and bishop. So for the moment, black is able to protect his weaknesses. And now what? How can white make progress here? Fischer plays f3. And as Eric Schiller writes, Fischer's plan is almost brutal in its simplicity. He wants to exchange rooks, marches king to d4, kick the knight from f6 and take on d5. That's the plan. Knight d7 was given by Grandmaster Yuri Averbach as an alternative to the move played in the game, but Averbach described it as the best of a bad bunch of options. Rook e to a7 was Petros Jan's choice. Now comes rook e5, attacking the pawn from the side as promised. Bishop d7, and now an extraordinary move. Here Fischer took on d7, giving up that beautiful knight on c5. As Fide Master Schiller explains in his book, the knight has done its job and now the domination of the open c file is the main objective. And I can add that this is a good example of the saying that it's not important which pieces are being swapped off, it's important which pieces remain on the board. And Fischer has judged correctly that the white bishop is stronger than the black knight. Those are the pieces that will remain on the board. Rook takes and rook c1, threatening rook c6, which would be very strong. Petrosian prevents that with rook d6. This rook is defending both weak pawns, but rooks want to roam free and not passively defend pawns. The rook on d6 is doing a job, but it would like to have more space. It would like to roam free and attack something in white's camp, for example, instead of just defending. Rook c7, okay, says Fischer, I cannot go to the 6th rank, but now I can go to the 7th. And if the other rook can get there as well, black will be in real trouble. As we know, two rooks on the 7th rank are very, very strong. Knight d7 to prevent the other rook coming to e7. Attacking the rook on e5, the rook drop back to e2. g6, king f2, and h5. Former world champion Michael Bodwinnik suggested rook b8 as a better option with some chances for counterplay for black. He gave this variation. The b pawn is hanging, so a3, then a5, b5, and a4 with some counterplay for black. But as mentioned, h5 was Petros Jan's choice. And now Fischer played f4. A very precise move, says Eric Schiller denying the knight the e5 square. h4 was played, king f3 improving the king's position, f5, king e3, Fischer is not in a rush, and here Fide Master Schiller gives this variation, knight f6, then the king goes to d4, knight e4 and rook e to c2 with total control over the c-file, which is as important as the 7th rank, writes Schiller. White will set his queen side majority in motion while black's pass pawn on d5 is not going anywhere. It's firmly blockaded. So that after king e3 and a knight f6, but in the game Petrosian played d4 check. King dropped back and knight b6. 
But now Fischer gets both rooks on the seventh rank. Rook e2, e7. And knight d5, which was played by Petros Jan, is not a real fork. It looks like it wins material, but it doesn't. Because Fischer can save both his rooks. Rook f7 check, king e8, and rook b7. Both rooks are out of reach of the knight. And it works tactically as well, as we'll see now. Because it looks for a moment that Fischer has dropped an important pawn. And Petros Jan took it, knight takes b4. And you cannot take that piece, because then your rook on f7 is hanging. So did Fischer make a mistake? Did he drop an important pawn? No he didn't, he had seen everything. He played bishop c4, and that decides the game. Petros Jan resigned here. The knight is now hanging on b4, as the rook is now protected. And if you save the knight, let's say knight c6, then there is rook h7, threatening mate with rook h8. So black plays rook f6. If rook h8, then the rook can interpose. And now it's up to you to find the mate in three. How does white checkmate the black king in three moves from here? It's not very difficult and it's nice to calculate this. Rook h8 check would come anyway. Rook f8 is the only move. But then the very nice move, bishop f7 check. Wonderful move. Protected by the rook on b7. King d8 only move. And now the rook on f8 is not protected anymore. And this is checkmate. A typical Bobby Fischer game. Simple maneuvers that you and I would play as well. The only problem is that if we try to play like Fischer, something goes wrong along the way and we lose. With this game, Fischer took a two-point lead on his way to match victory and the right to challenge Spassky for the world title. He also won the next two games to decide the match. By six and a half points to two and a half. I hope you enjoyed this match and that you will keep counting down towards the candidates tournament with me. During the event itself, I'm planning to do daily highlight videos. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to the Chess or Impress channel and please leave a comment. I will read them all and I will reply to them all. You may want to let me know who you think will win the candidates tournament. Karana and Ding are the favorites. If you like this video, then please share it on social media by clicking the share button on YouTube. You can find me on Instagram, on Twitter and on Facebook. This is Rick for Chess to Impress. Thank you for watching.